You ready to test? Yeah. Excellent. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry we have had a, a short minor glitch. Thank you for coming. Wow. And welcome to everyone, those who are joining us virtually. I don't know. They only stay out back, right? No, they no, back. Oh, they're still in the front. Oh, great. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sonobile Mwana. I'm an associate at SWAP and uh, a former deputy director at SWAP in the And SWAP is my home. Right, critical engagement with public sociology, a perspective from the global south. Finally, it is out. It's taken a very long time. Can you give the authors of the book was a round of applause. Okay. If you had any idea of how difficult and long the journey was, you would really clap. Can you please clap for real? <laughs> right, thank you very much. Uh, well, I have a, a task that is simple and complex at the same time. I'm moderating this session, I'm also the editor and, and one of the authors of the book. So I will uh, allow a few minutes uh, to Dr. Prashant Naidu, who is the director of SWAN, to come and give us a few words of welcoming, but not now. Uh, I mean, before that, I will also introduce Dr. Asanda Benya, who will be our discussant this, uh, this evening. Asanda is based at UCT, he's a senior lecturer, and he's a fellow at STIAS, Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. And he is also a very long time fellow at SWAP. So the book has received very positive reviews. I just, I'm just, without wasting much time, I'm just going to read just one. Uh, by Professor Nandini Sander uh, from Delhi University. So, drawing from sociology, South, South African politics and labor studies, this volume provides a much needed and inspirational account of what sociology could and should be. This is an essential history and practice that must be rem remembered and kept alive in the global disciplinary forums. Can you give the book? A round of applause. <laughs> right, and not only the positive, the positive some, there's some echo in the back. Not only did we receive uh, positive reviews, the book has also been nominated and selected as one of the six books to be presented at the author meet, meets critics session of the IASA World Congress of Sociology in Australia, Melbourne, in July next year. All right. So uh, thanks to the authors and, uh, and, and the contributors and uh, all for all the, the work that they've done. It is quite a comprehensive book with 13 chapters and 14 contributors. As you know, colleagues, you know, when it comes to books, uh, a book is, is not an, off, uh, an effort of a very few selection of people. It is an effort of a lot of people and organizations. So, so is the case with this book. I'd like to take this time to thank the Ford Foundation for the, the contribution they made for the first postdoctoral fellowship that produced this book and the conceptualization of this book. And I also want to mention, uh, in particular, Alberto Arubas Lazano, was part of the postdoctoral cohort at the time. And also the contribution and support that SWAP has made to make this book a, a reality. FES South Africa, that is Frederick Ebert Stiftung, South Africa, contributed towards the initial inception workshop that we had in 2018 for this book. And without that support, the book would have not have been a reality. And we would like to also give thanks to the Bristol University Press, the publisher of the book, and also to colleagues who have organized 
this help us to organize this event, Lucinda and Tasmanian Tess. Let us just give them a round of applause. They have done a wonderful job. <laughs> and just, just now, we, we had a problem with electricity and they put us back on track as fast as possible. And last but not least, I would like to thank Swap and Rhodes University for contributing and supporting this event, this launch. Without that support, this event would not have been possible. So thank you, thank you very much for, for coming. I just have a, a few more announcements. One, we have a discount that is running for the book now, and you better make sure you secure a copy. The book is at a 50% price right now, and um, if you haven't received this paper at the front, make sure that you get in touch, send an email to Lucina. She's going to send you the voucher electronically. The voucher contains a link where you are going to open, it said available for, for purchase at. That link is going to, to guide you on how to purchase the book. So this is the structure of this discussion tonight. Uh, after Prishani has given us her words of welcome, Asanda will take over. And he will, she will uh, stimulate the discussion through a set of questions to the editors and the, author, and the, and the authors. And from, from there, we shall open up the discussion for the, to the floor. So, without further ado, I would ask Prashant to please come forward and welcome us at SWAP. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome you on behalf of SWAP, the Society of Work and Politics Institute, and the Department of Sociology at Rhodes University. We're co-hosting this event tonight. But I think more importantly, I also want to say a very big congratulations again to the editors and the authors. And thank you to each of the editors and the authors um, for what is itself a set of critical uh, reflections on the concept of critical engagement that the book puts forward as growing in the first instance from the work of Professor Eddie Webster, who was the founding director um, of SWAP, uh, and its relationship to the concept of public sociology coming from the work of Michael Burroway in relation to uh, his understanding and relationship to South African society. And I think as such, it offers also a really critical reflection on SWAP's almost 40 year history. Um, and the rich and vast archive of experiences as an academic institute in the South, engaging with and mobilizing theory from the North um, in a way that's also productive of new concepts and new ways um, of engaging with the world. And I think importantly, it's also presented as a contribution to the development of sociology as a discipline uh, in which scholars are committed to effecting social change. Uh, in the world. I'll leave it to the editors and authors to speak more to this as this is the main content of the book. But I think it's also important for us to acknowledge this particular moment in which the book is being launched, which is the uh, centenary celebration of this, um, uh, which have largely been uncritical. Um, and I think this is an important book that opens up a space for looking more critically and closely at the place of the university uh, in a changing society. And SWAP as a research institute is important in this regard as it's allowed for its own approaches and contributions to knowledge production to be shaped by these changes over time. <clears throat> but it's also another important moment for SWAP because we're undergoing change as well. Um, and this is a really important book for those of us who are currently in SWAP uh, and have undertaken to characterize society not just as precarious, but also in crisis. Um, and saying that means also acknowledging that the social sciences is in crisis. So the book ends with Professor Carl Holt, the former director of SWAT, 
uh, also putting forward the idea that the concept of critical engagement and the practice of critical engagement um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, uh, shapes a counter-hegemonic sociology. Um, and that is debated in the book. But I think it's also important for us going forward in SWAP over the next 40 years, hopefully, um, in trying to think what it means uh, for us who are not all sociologists, Taz pointed out to me earlier today. Uh, there are very few sociologists at SWAP at the moment. But what does, what does it mean for us to also think the limits of sociology and the social sciences as we move forward with the experiments that we've started to undertake with scholars um, in the arts, for example, and in other disciplines. But I want to reiterate my thanks um, and congratulations, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you very much, Michelle. I would also like to do the same and reiterate my thanks, profound thanks to, to Swa. So, Asanda, are you ready to keep the ball running? We've lost Asanda. I think we should, I think we should um, start the discussion. She will join us. Um, she did send me a, a few questions just now when we had load shedding. I think the, the first question could be, uh, could be the, uh, the good starting point, especially for, I mean, for the editors and also I mean, for some of the authors who would like to sort of make a contribution. She asked us to unpack the framing, the broader framing of, 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 of the book, you know. And uh, she thanks us for the really interesting good contributions uh, to the volume. Uh, to scholarship on critical engagement and beyond sociology. Uh, and then she says, I hesitate to say sociology because contributions in this book go beyond sociology. And she says, I think the volume raises a lot of important questions about how we make sense of the kind of work at SWAP <laughs> and other institutes, including LAC and PLUS, etc., that, uh, that have been producing, uh, that, uh, that have been producing knowledge. And it raises questions about this, uh, the discipline of sociology, political and, and conceptual questions about methodologies. So she asked us to unpack the, the, the frame of, of, of the book. I don't know, maybe I, I could just say a few things and then Carl and then other, other authors and especially the editors may say something. Yeah. I think if I were to be asked to unpack the framing of the book, I mean, as a standard has done, I think the, prim I mean, the primary question raised throughout the book is whether the idea of critical engagement makes a meaningful contribution to the formation of what we call counter-hegemonic sociology. And in order to address this question, we have put together a range of, of contributions that presented detailed case studies based on South Africa, Chile, and Turkey. And I think, in my opinion, this is a unique account that offers an account from on, on experiences from the South. And the, the volume explores the trajectory of the political, politically engaged scholarship, the practice that we conceptualize, drawing in, on Edward Webster's work as critically engaged sociology. We put the concept of critical engagement in conversation with uh, the concept or the idea of public sociology uh, uh, by Michael Cohen, by Michael Burawa, who agreed that it was inspired by South African sociology, in particular the political engaged scholarship at, at SWAP. A number of chapters unpack this, particularly focusing on the vastly different historical uh, and, and, and social context under which the two concepts were forged. I don't want to 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 speak more on this. I think other editors, perhaps Carl, may want to respond a bit more. Thanks, So I, I would want to um, take, take the story of the book back, in a sense, to the encounter between Michael, Michael Burroway, and Eddie, um, out of which, in a long sense, 
this book emerges. And I think that it's this encounter that, and, and the fact that it's been sustained over 30 years at least, uh, and that the baton of the conversation has been handed over to later generations of sociologists. Um, so I think in the first instance myself, well, in the first instance actually Sakela, Sakela Bukhungu, who was that swap um, for a large part of that time. And then I take it up, uh, Alberto, um, our postdoc, as Sonobile has mentioned, uh, took it up and in fact came out, with, came out swinging from his corner with a, a hectic attack on Michael's stuff, uh, which I think really um, enabled us to see the whole history and encounter differently. And I think it's this, I think it's this 40 year period um, of conceptual formation in the South and in the North between uh, a radical sociologist who's based in the US and a research institute in, in the South, in South Africa, that is engaging primarily with labor at the time. Um, and this is what makes the book in, in, you know, kind of unique. So what happens is that Michael comes to South Africa in, uh, in um, 1990 and is really excited at the vibrancy of sociology. Not just SWAP, by any manner of means, but the broader kind of vibrancy and engagement. And he thinks about, uh, you know, the very professionalized hierarchical sociology in the US. Uh, and, and he starts thinking about how does, he, how does he take the South African experience and use it to shake up US sociology in some sense. And he then develops this concept of public sociology. He didn't invent the term, but he deepens it and he develops a kind of conceptual grounding of public sociology. And he comes back and addresses the sociologist in South Africa in 2004 and tells us all about public sociology, in which he talks is derived from what we've been doing here, but he's systematizing it and giving us a way of thinking about it. So, I mean, I don't know, I think that there's a degree of puzzlement in South Africa. I mean, you know, what's so special about this account? It's a little bit, public sociology, I think, in, certainly in my view, uh, struck me as quite dull compared to the kind of work that we are doing. Um, but at the same time, we've been recognized globally. Michael goes on a big campaign globally uh, over the next couple of decades, popularizing public sociology with a great degree of success. And it's only somewhat, so we start using the term. Edian, myself, it's a Kela, and whoever, we start talking about us, our public sociology. Although a bit uneasily because it, it doesn't really seem as exciting as what we're doing. Um, and then we start to rethink and think again. And, and, and that's, where, I mean, that's where the book emerges. Uh, with Alberto, as I say, in the first instance, so the couple of the pieces that I wrote, and then, um, and then with this book, what, what my chapter does, is it goes back to Eddie's work, his thinking about sociology in the early 80s and even the late 70s as he's engaging with unions and doing sociology that, uh, that works with unions and the liberation movement more, more broadly. And that's where the concept of critical engagement comes out. And so the, this book emerges out of that conversation and in, in a sense the conversation in some sense, the conversation continues because there's a chapter in it by Michael as well. But I wanted to draw attention to that, and I think our sense that it sort of illuminates the, 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 the importance of the context in which sociology is being thought. So Michael takes our practice and translates it into US sociology, and in the translation, we think, loses a lot of what we were up to. But in a sense, US sociology gains, gets a sort of a, a certain version of what we're doing. And we then rethink it challenges us to now think again about what is it that we are doing, what is critical engagement, and how can we deepen and elaborate that as a critique of northern sociology as well as a kind of analysis of our practice as sociologists. So that's really what I would want to say about that's at the heart, that's kind of at the core of the book. And then we build on a whole lot of other accounts, a whole lot of other um, social scientists who are engaging, doing different kinds of engaged research, trying to change the world at the same time as producing scientific knowledge. Um, and, 
and those are the chapters. Then we go beyond swap. I mean, we go to, to people who, who are not in swap, although they are friends, like they, they're down the corridor, like Anto Koso, um, or, or just down the drag in Cape Town, but working in the same field and working with us, like the people from Lark. So that's really, uh, uh, that's what I would want to say about the kind of core of, of, of what the book is. Thank you very much, Carl. Asanda, we were addressing your first question. I hope you are, you are listening. Because I have Asanda is back. Is she back? Okay, so, when you say something, I'm just... Eddie, you want to say something? I mean, there was one to say something? No, that's right. Okay, let me get to the... Is Asana back? Uh, yes, she should be back. Okay, Asana, can you hear us? Can you speak to her? I can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we'll just address your first question on the framing of the book. <laughs> if you could then go to the second question, please. Yes, go ahead to the second question. There's some other living ancestors here. The past uh, head of the sociology department, uh, Gerhard Skutter. You want to stand up, Gerhard? We'll see if nobody is here with us. Uh, and and my, yeah. And, my, and my colleague, uh, who I worked very closely with, Glenn Adler, who currently works with the uh, Service Employees International Union in Washington. Uh, is online here. I just want to mention that by way of introduction. But on the concept of critical engagement, uh, if you look, if you read it, you will see it says quite unequivocally that uh, researchers should engage, but at the centre of it is they should retain their autonomy. So, and. To illustrate that, my, my chapter uh, in the book is a demonstration of how we critiqued the union. So, a, a little bit, uh, 
the argument that we are close to the unions, um, yes, of course we are close because he wanted to give support to their goals. But in my chapter, I explain how doing research on HIV AIDS in 1988, when there were only 200 cases here, the National Union of Mine Workers, the General Secretary at the time, was Sir Ramaphosa, contacted me and said, Eddie, there is no way you can publish this. And I said to Cyril, there's no way I can not publish this. I can have a look at it carefully and make sure that it's accurate and not insensitive, but I cannot not publish it. That is what we do at the university. And eventually, after many negotiations, we came to, to an agreement. So, uh, it, it, my understanding of the project from the very beginning was that we give support to the goals of these movements, particularly Labour, but we guided by, our, by, the, by the, the, the data, the information, the evidence, our conscience, our judgment, and for many, uh, in fact, the whole concept of critical engagement, as you will recall, Carl, came out of our struggles with the labor movement. I want to emphasize that. They came out of our struggles with certain people in the labor movement who wanted to censor us. And we refused to be censored. Uh, but we also, at the same time, wanted to give support. So I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that, that, that it, it's, uh, I think working with someone doesn't mean that you, 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 you're no longer independent uh, from the uh, retain of autonomy, and that is the evidence. I, it took many years before Sir Ramaphosa would uh, talk to me. Of course, now he had absolutely no reason to talk to me. But uh, <laughs> I'll just mention that as part of our history. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Eddie. Um, well, uh, she, she's still not there, right? No, she is. Okay, because it was good. Asanda? But any, I mean, I think that not just Eddie, you don't want to go ahead. Okay. I would like to. No, you don't. Use the mic. Is it is working now. It's fine. Anna, can you hear me? No. Okay, it's fine. Okay, um, Good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Dobo Zwingwana. I am not a swap, I'm just on the corridor though. <laughs> I'm with ACMS, uh, the African Center for Migration and Society. Uh, we are a research center uh, based here at WIRTS, and uh, we focus more on um, migration, displacement, uh, research, but we also offer postgraduate studies, so that's why I'm also doing my PhD there. So, but the work that I present in the chapter in the book, and the chapter is titled Feminist Participatory Action Research in African Sex Work Studies, um, is work that I did like a couple of years back, uh, my honors and masters. But what was quite awesome with this collection is that it allowed me to revisit that work and rather focus more on the methodology, because much of the publications that stemmed out of uh, the previous work we were focusing more on the findings. So this was a good opportunity for me to revisit some of the methodology. And what Asanda mentioned earlier is actually quite true. And just to give a bit of background and to situate myself in all of this, um, I self-identify as a scholar activist, uh, but that came much later. My background really is in activism. Uh, for many years, I worked for the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task Force, which is an NGO that advocates for the rights of adult consenting sex workers in South Africa. And so, from there onwards, um, what actually steered me towards sex work studies was the frustration that we used to experience at SWIT. I was part of the advocacy team. We would find that whenever we tried to go out and lobby like parliamentarians, or speak to fellow feminists, there was this resistance because we were not seen as um, fellow feminists. We were not seen as people who were engaging in sex work willingly. We were seen as people that needed to be rescued. And this posed a challenge when you're trying to like form alliances, you know, when you were being like, we also want to be around this table, you know, we also want to be part of the solutions, you know. And so um, from then onwards, we realized
organized a group of us uh, who were part of Sisonke and Sweat. Sisonke is the movement of sex workers in South Africa. We realized that we needed to take a step back and reevaluate for ourselves then what does it mean to be an African, a sex worker, and a feminist? Um, and that work, okay, and that work was done in uh, 2014. Uh, but then I also tested the findings of that study in 2015 with the African Sex Worker Alliance. And for both studies, the question I was really asking is, what does it mean to be an African sex worker feminist? And so in this chapter, I focus quite a lot on the <laughs> on the methods that I used with ASWA. And the methodology that I want to speak on today is feminist participatory action research, which I find it is quite helpful when you're working with populations which are either marginalized or criminalized in the cases of sex workers. But really, what um, what also feminist participatory action research, feminist participatory action research, sorry, allows us to do is to do just what we're talking about, to be able to be critical and theoretical but also to be practical uh, in the sense that the scholarship that we produce can go back to the people that we work with and they can use it for their own activism and advocacy. And for me, actually, it was also the other way around, whereby my scholarship is informed by my activism. So the kind of um, issues or topics that I pick up come from the conversations that I've had with like my fellow comrades during the marches or after a dialogue, we realized, no, something didn't go right there. Uh, we need to kind of revisit ourselves in this. And the frustration is that um, whoever you present the work to, be it with um, your fellow academics, there's always this thing like, ah, but you know, you're speaking from the heart. Uh, we can't really trust that your work is like ethically sound or methodologically, methodologically rigorous or your scholarship is innovative because you kind of like just want to push the course. And so you kind of have to go the extra, like that proverbial mile, improving yourself. And also the flip side is that when you also present to your fellow comrades, there's this thing like, ah, but when I, you're now in the ivory towers, you know, you're good. you're so removed from the ground, you know, you don't know the struggle anymore. And so there again, it's also about making that scholarship accessible enough for the people that you work with to be able to actually take and run with it. So it is a frustration, but it's an interesting space to work from because, like I mentioned, it feeds off each other. So like I started off saying, I'm a scholar activist. So critical engagement or engaged scholarship or whatever you want to call it, but the fact that the scholarship is informed by the activism and vice versa is what I think is quite powerful in the kind of work that we're doing in this book. Okay, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I think I will take it from here and, and push it forward. Uh, Anders, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm I think the public sociology take on this question would be theoretical thinking happens in the domain of professional sociology and critical sociology. And, and, and public sociology and policy sociology, in a way, is where you engage society. And I think Mr. Paul's point beautifully illustrates how those that categorization in, in Buruoi's classification of different, different modes of sociology don't really make sense in our context. This knowledge here isn't only created in the university, it's created in the field. In act. While you're doing the activism, you are facing real problems and you have to theorize those on the go. And I think that's a fundamental point we make in the book. Absolutely. That, that, those are a good points. I think I will, I think since now, our participation action research, it's me. Uh, I will just jump to your question, but there was a question from Kwanda and I, which I will address later. So Asanda is asking a very interesting question, and I think the words we've covered yours quite well. So Brittany, your chapter, uh, you reflect quite well in your chapter on, on your work with a group of people in Johannesburg around food justice. Can you reflect on, uh, on doing research that has an immediate impact on the lives of your participants, rather than a delayed impact that may come about through publications that may influence government policy, NGOs, social movements, etc. I don't know whether I got that question. Thanks. Thank you, Sonobine. Thank you, Asanda, for the original question. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, to just 
absolutely agree with everything that was just said, <coughs> said about participatory action research. Um, for me, not coming from a background of sociology and therefore not being so conversant in the debates around public sociology and critical engagement prior to being part of this book project, um, it seemed so obvious to me that the point of the research is to change the world, otherwise why are we doing it? Uh, when we live in a, in a situation of crisis and extreme injustice, we can't just pretend to be detached and neutral, which anyway is a false notion from sort of colonial research times. Um, the point of the research is to change the world, and so um, participatory action research takes that, I think, a step further than even the critical engagement idea, which, as I've understood it, does engage research with movements and struggles in order to produce knowledge, which is then useful. Um, and participatory action research and the kind of research that I did also seeks to produce knowledge that is useful to struggles, in my case, for food justice. But knowing that the knowledge may or may not ultimately be used to change a policy or to inform the activities of a movement or of an NGO that might effect change, the goal is to also effect change through the research process itself. Um, and that is, of course, the ideal type of participatory action research, and it's very much harder to achieve in practice. But the goal is that through participation, through the co-production of knowledge, through engaging in conversations and discussion with participants in a more leveled, equal fashion, based in reciprocity, that very process itself is empowering to participants. It helps to conscientize them in the prairie sense of seeing their individual struggles as social problems. It helps them to see and think about alternatives and solutions to their problems so that whether or not one ever publishes, and in my case, thank goodness for this chapter, <laughs> um, the publications may be slow, but the process itself has made a change already. And the participants in the research have benefited from participating in the research um, quite counter to the more extractive model of going in and taking up their time and interviewing them and leaving. Um, and I think in my case, or in both of our cases, using creative methods also helps. Uh, so it's not just a conversation, but also engaging in, in physical activity and creative artistic uh, production, in my case, in things like cooking together uh, and eating together. All of those different methods also sort of build rapport, build trust, deepen the discussion, and really facilitate uh, being able to, to make change through the participatory action research process. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, do you want to add anything to what it was? So Asanda asked me uh, a question. I don't know whether, Nwanda and Anika, are you there? I can hear you a little bit. Can you put, can you hear me? Nwanda? Yes. which is on the dilemmas between the legal and the sociological field. Particularly the challenge of, the challenge of balancing legal and community perceptions and approaches to social justice. Community property associations bill that means uh, 
any sort of comment. Obviously, we know that sometimes if it's going to be held at a public hearing, it's going to be held in Limpopo. We for sure know that some of the communities that we work with do not have this information. So we'll take this information, give it to community members, find ways with our other partners to host a workshop specifically around community property, communal property associations, sort of explaining what the whole entire bill is going to cover, making sure sometimes because there's issues of language that we find and try to accommodate and we'll bring ways in which we try to make this as simple as possible so that communities can see the connection, but most importantly, they tell us where they feel this bill is going to be a problem in their lives. So some of these things is sort of like being an intermediary between parliament and communities because there is a mobilization aspect to the research unit that we that that I work at and the predominant thing is also our physical presence at all these public hearings, all the workshops that we will be hosting. So sometimes there is a way in which we could write up and sort of say, I went to a public hearing, I observed X, Y, and Z, this is what wasn't achieved. At the end of the day, Parliament is going to pass it, but these are the repercussions. But simultaneously, we make sure that people, um, especially rural communities that we work with, get information to actively participate um, in these processes. So, so those are some of the immediate things that we actively try to do and actually not try to center ourselves as researchers because we try to make sure that what, what our community is um, trying to say, that's something that we also cover in our book chapter, sort of under partnerships, the, the way in which we sort of engage when we want to write, um, uh, what is it? or when we want to prepare for oral submissions or written submissions to Parliament. Thank you, Solabile. Thank you, thank you so much, Nobana. Please don't go away. Um, I don't know if Anika is also with you, but because there's quite an interesting question as well, which is a follow-up to what you have just addressed, some of the issues you have addressed here. But um, some of the ambivalences and challenges we have encountered around the academic field Asada says, the work you do at LAC, uh, um, as LAC is, clear, is a clear navigation of the political and the legal field. To some extent, a tenuous and a distant navigation to the academic field. I don't know whether you want to, to, to touch on some of the challenges you encounter within the academic space as critical engaged scholars. Um, yeah, so sorry to I don't think Anika will be able to join us because she hasn't logged in as yet. But um, yeah, I mean, our book chapter is the dilemmas and challenges of so, uh, a socially engaged research unit. So, in as much as it may seem quite pessimistic, I think it's, it's so, sort of in the same way that the previous speakers framed socially engaged with participatory action research, activist research, it's such a um, I don't even know how to put it sometimes. It's, it's an exciting way to work, but it's very difficult for a traditional uh, academic space because it feels like it's delegitimized, even though it goes through the same rigor sometimes um, that journal articles would go through. So in as much as we would produce a, for example, a parliamentary submission on again, uh, communal property associations, that written submission can easily be turned into a journal article, can easily be turned into a book chapter. But the main thing that we're trying to also emphasize is there's an immediate impact that you have, but then there's also um, legitimacy in us being located within the law faculty at UCT because we deal with law. And with, it's law in practice, actually. So law is lived as we're sort of doing it and we're bringing, especially because we're dealing with living customary law. So we have this approach that integrates mobilization, litigation and research. 
So within working with our partners, we would bring the research aspect, our other partners make sure that we find ways to actively mobilize. And then there's obviously, if now we have to go to litigate on the issue. So we have this mode of working that's actually quite holistic. And in terms of achieving societal change, this is what we actively are trying to do because it's good to be researchers, but researchers are not <laughs> finding issues in a lab. We don't just create social issues in a lab. We find them existing out there. And what we bring is our expertise in analyzing and explaining and unpacking what that actual societal issue is. So my favorite part of doing sociology was learning about the sociological imagination because I like, oh, so there's a real way of thinking differently about society that's not located in the present. It's like, no, the future can become what you want it to be. So even in 2018, when we started discussing our different book chapters, um, we wanted to write about our experience because even as researchers, we can research ourselves. We can look and sit down and go through this very uh, good space of being reflexive and looking at our ways of working and seeing. It's, it's a very encouraging thing to hear, especially the former speakers, the two former speakers saying, this is how I'm doing the research and I'm actually an activist and a researcher simultaneously. So that doesn't feel like you're doing a, a balancing act of trying to be two different people when it's okay to bring your entire self into the research. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's literally sort of what we're trying to say with the paper. And yeah, I think I don't want to overspeak, but yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. All the chapters are very rich and we're not going to be able to cover all the chapters exhaustively here. And um, yeah, Anders, you wanted to, to say something about, yeah. I just, I want to make a, a brief input about the chapters on, on Chile and Turkey on this specific point. Uh, uh, Dustin Julian's chapter on Turkey is really fascinating because he sets up, uh, 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 in, in, in Chile, sets up a research unit modeled on SWAP, linked to the labor movement. Uh, and it's located in a university, and what happens is they get work out by the university uh, because of their activism. And they then have to move, and they basically set up then an NGO attached to another university. So a, a really and it's a point we make about working in the global south. It's not easy. Uh, actually, I don't know if he's online. If he is, he should speak for himself. But he basically he has to he has to leave Turkey for his own safety. Uh, because of his activist uh, stance on research. So uh, I think it's very different from, from doing, doing activist research in the global south than, than the context in, in the global north where you have quite protected spaces in, in universities, although I suspect that might be also closing down increasingly in the future. So I just wanted to highlight the, the, two, the two international chapters in, in comparison to our experience in South Africa. You can say that again. Academic autonomy is a significant challenge right now. Jackie wants to say something. Jackie, can you hear me? Um, yes, uh, Solo Baby. Look, it's, di it's difficult for me to, to make an intervention because the sound uh, from the microphone is very, very uh, difficult. But I, I wanted to stress uh, a, a point that the last speaker made about uh, the nature of sociological engagement with social movements. And I feel it's difficult to do when there is no um, mass-based movement as a single actor with tidy margins. But I would like to think that, there, that sociologists have the potential to um, empower through their research. And I'm thinking of sharing information, as has been mentioned, but also um, the SWAP uh, just transition research from in 2019 found that it was important to build the confidence of communities and um, not just share information, but also to stress the importance of organizing collectively. And I believe that um, 
that is empowering people and it is most it is most easily done in our experience and i hope victor and Tadeo would agree with me that it was through exchange workshops which were structured around the question of what is it like to live in a mining affected community and what would you most like to change so it's addressing community needs very very centrally but certainly in a way that doesn't present any dualism between environmental issues or um, livelihood questions, economic survival, because the key driving understanding of the project was to make sure that the voices of excluded and marginalized communities were heard and their needs were addressed. And in the current debate about a just transition, well, it's been appropriated by elites, those um, interests of local people who are the worst affected by climate change are neglected. And a key question is to provide jobs and address their needs when coal mines are closed. So what I'm trying to suggest is that, well, certainly what, what my chapter tries to argue is that exchange workshops can be more empowering than individual interviews, which can often be a form of extractivist research, which simply extract information and not empowering in themselves. And I think, Eddie, I want to say uh, that perhaps your argument about supporting social movements um, raises the question of should we not go further than that through a process of empowerment which is suited to particular circumstances. Thank you. Okay. Don't go away yet, Zeki. Just one question that Asanda raised, which I find quite important for you to address. And she said, Jake, can you directly address the question of power in participatory action research and the inherent paradox in reinforcing hierarchies while trying to be actively involved and transforming relations with communities? Did you get that? I mean, I don't know if Jackie heard that the question was being addressed to her. I'm not sure if people can even hear me. Yeah, but Jackie, I was saying, the question I was posing was that in your chapter, you, you directly address this question around power, uh, even in participatory action research, that the inherent paradoxes of reinforcing hierarchies while trying to actively involve, to be actively involved in transforming these relations within society, communities, and so forth. And I was wondering if you can maybe speak to that question of uh, reinforcing hierarchies and how one negotiates or navigates or resolves these kind of paradoxes that you point to. Well, I think the, it, it, it's a crucial question, Asanda, and it's a it's a very difficult one. But I think it has to depend on how you conceptualize the research process and what you're trying to achieve. And to me, there's far too much individualism in um, the academic community at the moment, instead of a collective approach and trying to, trying to strengthen social movements. And of course, this is critical to both uh, public sociology and critical engagement. I mean, it's how World War defines organic sociology, um, it's how uh, the editors of this book define critical engagement, one's relationship with social movements. And so what I'm trying to suggest is that uh, support, well, it's the nature of that support, because I think it has the potential to be empowering and to give people voice and to force um, change that takes account of their needs and interests, which is totally neglected in, in South Africa at the moment. So it's a case of how, what one's motives are, and what one's trying to achieve. And to me, the, too much of the academic world is focused on individualism, on individual careers and progress and power. And I think we have to be much more modest and, and stop talking about informants and rather talk about partners and establish relationships of equality and, and, and shared values and shared um, commitments to social and environmental justice. So I think I see, well, I certainly define myself as an academic activist, but I think it does, it does involve um, a certain, or I try to um, arrive at a certain um, modesty in terms of how we define our role in relation to grassroots 
are mass-based organizations. Thank you. Thanks. There, there, there's a number of questions. One, one of them includes claim making and the question of ethics as critical engaged scholars, but we may not get to that. I just want to open this opportunity for the floor. I don't like the term floor anyway. It seems like there's a hierarchy there. For, for our partners in the room, we're critical engaged scholars. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm sure there are people dying to say, I think we're two raised questions. We really apologize for the glitches, the uh, technological glitches that we've had, but I think this is modern South Africa now. Is this ready? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, any tech cars? Any hand? Yes, Pat. Um, okay, I, maybe, I, I, maybe you can just speak. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, people online. Okay. So I think my question relates to, I guess it would apply to the research as well, with particularly the question around being interested in the work that you're doing. I mean, in your case, you, know, you come from this organization that also has based of activism. Um, what are some of the nuances outside of the fact that you get to produce work that is relevant to the Causes that you've committed yourself to. I'm, I'm speaking in terms of you as a researcher. Like, what is it that is different that you are able to bring in to the discipline of sociology? Um, but also, perhaps, are there any ethical concerns that one ought to account for? You know, because I realize also with the discipline itself, sometimes in terms of methodology and accounting for what is true and what is worthy of account, considering. Sometimes there's also the, the academy saying to you that because you come from this place, as you were saying, then some of your methodologies are not worth accounting for. So, so yeah, that's my question. Thanks, Yeah, I think even other authors can, can answer that question. But I, I would like to take a second question in the interest of time. Let's look at here. Mine is really a question or a comment about audience. I mean, the question of who is the audience for the research? Who, who's the, who are you writing and researching for? And it seems to me that it's, it's possible for public sociology, for a piece of public sociology research to be addressed to policymakers or to people who will read, you know, 300 page reports, um, it's possible. I'm thinking of the, the basic income grant research that is being done at the moment. It's largely based, it's largely addressed to the policy makers and the people who are currently against any idea of a basic income grant. Because workers don't have to be convinced of, of the need of a basic, or working class people don't need to be convinced of the need for a basic income grant. But there are other pieces of public sociology where the audience is clearly intended to be, uh, you know, the partners in the research or the, the, yeah, the movement, whether it be the labor movement, whether it be the sex workers organization, whether it be food sovereignty or uh, activists. But it seems to me that, that, and I don't know if this is addressed in the book, but the question of translating the research findings and the papers and so on into digestible, uh, yeah, di into a digestible form through social media, through videos, through pamphlets, you know, how much attention is being paid by the the public sociologists to that process. Um, yeah. So, sorry, can I ask you so, to say, say yeah. name, please? Because, I mean, can I ask you to say your name, please? So that I'm asking sorry, Jane, Jane, Jane Barrett. So that people can, yeah. Thank you. So your name is my brother? No. Oh, okay. Is there any other questions? All right. Uh, just <laughs> okay, I also wanted to respond. That's fine. Are you going? No, no, no. 
Okay, thanks Mpo for that question. <laughs> okay, so that's the thing, I know Asan actually raised this earlier on, it's like um, they share around terminology and, and, and all of that. And for me to be honest with you, I, before, the work that I do, I did not really see as sociology because I was just doing research that made sense in terms of the people and the issues that I was trying to work with. And it was only when I like was in full force in academia where I was like able to find the terms like, oh, actually what I'm doing is called this. And I think perhaps that's my contribution to sociology, bringing, <laughs> I don't even want to say freshness because even Amina Mama says that um, when they were forming the African Gender Institute at UCT, like I think back in the 1990s or something like that, there, there was already a recognition by African feminists that knowledge production is not divorced from uh, activism or feminism uh, on the ground. So for me, it's also just bringing that reminder and, and I suppose that's what the book does as well in terms of reclaiming that knowledge uh, that Michael Burroway um, took from you and then reconceptualized and then brought it back to us again to say, actually, we've been doing this. Uh, we might not have been using the sociology terms, but yeah, just also the acknowledgement that we do have like indigenous forms of knowledge production that sociology or your university types forms of sociology can also benefit from. So yeah, I think I'll leave it from there. Thanks, I'll try to, to be brief today. Um, I think research that has been carefully and rigorously done is bound to lend itself to audiences that you didn't expect to have in the beginning. Um, I remember the work we did in Northwestern Zimbabwe Swap, where mining companies were colluding with local chiefs and dispossessing rural residents. Uh, so, what we used to do was to produce easily accessible research reports that people could read, especially those who could read, could read English. I mean, primarily before we, we, we produced academic, academic uh, articles, etc. I remember we produced a couple of these working papers, and at some point, because some of these uh, struggles between local chiefs and, and, and uh, rural residents who have been dispossessed went to courts, and uh, we used to get approached by lawyers at times to write expert affidavits. And at one point I got uh, approached, and I declined to write an expert affidavit because I've been doing research there for a very long time, and lawyers select clients, and we have participants, you know, and participants could, could belong to any social movement and to, to, to any group. And the way the rights were being interpreted by, by the lawyers was going to create divisions in the long run. But fortunately, we had these working papers you know, at hand. And they used that working paper successfully. And they won a major court case, I mean, court victory for, 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 for the rural residents. But I mean, what, what I'm trying to say, I think that first and foremost, you should focus on rigor in research. And then, and then when you're writing, then think about the audience, but quite often it may end up with audiences that you didn't expect initially, especially if research has taken time and, uh, and, and it has had enough rigor to attract even uh, lawyers who can use it in court cases. Because if, if, if you, for instance, write an, an expert affidavit, you know, in that case where there were divisions, Historically, people used to share land, you know, generously. And now mining companies want to identify the direct beneficiaries. And they only want to deal with who is a beneficiary. And lawyers want to select clients who are beneficiaries. And as a researcher, I, I, I felt quite contradicted in, in this instance. Because, I mean, I could easily write, I mean, according to the research, that these were the descendants of the people who had purchased the farm. And they were dispossessed historically. But the farm had many users throughout, and the <laughs> land rights were used generously throughout. And, and that was going to create even further divisions. So I think that one needs to be very 
careful. I think that yes, audience is very important, but I think that the primary focus should also be to, to, to produce work that is accessible to a much broader audience initially, and especially the audience of, of the, the marginalized classes who, who can use it, those simply accessible written work for, to defend their the struggles. And I think that we have we have done quite well in, 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 in to do that. At, at, I mean, in the past, I mean, this is just but one of the few few examples, you know. I mean, people can write obvious. I, I believe that, especially I've been working with rural with rural communities. I've written a couple of obvious. I don't think they've written they've read obvious. I mean, you would you would meet an activist in the rural. Uh, I mean, in some of the rural areas. When I read your opt at about mining company, yes, but many people really don't know that. But I mean, I was impressed in one of the recent conferences where I was invited to speak, and I sat on the panel with one of the activists, Mama Ledu, who was dispossessed uh, by the mine, and they won the, I mean, they won the, the constitutional court and they were compensated. And uh, I mean, I don't know whether, I think she knew that I was there, but I mean, in her opening remarks, she, said, she, she just said, I mean, we were helped by research that was done by people like Sumabi. I mean, it, then I remembered initially how difficult it was to explain research. Because when you come to people whose land is being dispossessed and they are being chased out of the land, and you say, I'm a researcher, they say, then what do you, what do you want? Because these people have been dealing with lawyers all the time. So you're a researcher, then what? What does researcher? How will this research help us? You know? And it took years to make people to understand. I mean, Eli has spoken about autonomy here. You know, I mean, it, and, and it's a very intricate <laughs> balance. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult process you know, to navigate, and it takes years and years for people to identify you as a researcher and to understand the impacts of research and slow sociology in the long run. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. So, thanks, Somabile. So, uh, I mean, uh, on Jane's question, you know, so the book, I don't think anything in the book really uh, pays close attention to the problems and questions and struggles around popular right. And it's a whole, it is a whole area and it's not really covered here. Uh, the book is, I think, um, primarily a kind of reflexive and conceptual work engaging in what is, what is socially engaged uh, social science. How does it work? And what are the methodologies? How, does, how do activist scholars work and so on and so forth? Um, I suppose for a new a new generation of, of, of scholars and to um, settle some, some of the questions r regarding uh, this kind of work around public sociology and so on. Um, and in, 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 in relation to that, so what I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to draw on that to, to make the point which there's a tension in the book. And that's, I think that's one of the good things about it is that the different chapters are talking about different kinds of experiences. And uh, researchers starting from different, uh, different points in the spectrum of, of, of engaged sociology or engaged social science. So there's been quite, you know, quite a lot of um, powerful uh, discussion this evening around participatory action research and working very closely with, with, um, with the research community. Uh, and empowering them through that. There's other chapters that <coughs> grapple with <coughs> the question that the field in which we research is a power-laden field. It's got powerful people, it's got leaders. You know, so we talk about, we talk about trade unions. The trade unions have got general secretaries. The trade unions have got shop stewards. The trade unions have got members. You know, and these are all different, different people at different levels in the organization with different stakes. So when we say we're doing research with the trade union, who are we talking about? You know, are we doing research that the um, research officer and the general secretary have commissioned, because they want to know more about what the workers, you know, who are their members think about certain questions? Or are we going to, um, to workers at the, at the base to say, uh, you know, what, is, what are the problems that you experience? Do you think that the unions work in, in the right way. And, and, and you know, then you get Eddie's, the, the, the experiences that Eddie has in that context 
which is where the union rejects your work. And that's become, I mean, it's become increasingly difficult as unions have actually competed with each other and as they've become more hierarchical. So one of the cases that I've talked about in my chapter is Crispin, Crispin Chibuna's work uh, on the mine work on the NUF in the platinum belt, just around the point where <clears throat> the Maracana massacre is happening, the strikes and then the massacre. And his experience of going in, like supported by the deputy president of the union and by the branch officials, the regional officials, and they see him as someone who will open up their understanding of problems in the union. But as he starts working with, you know, with workers and shop stewards, he starts to realize more and more that there's a kind of a deep mistrust, a deep critique, actually, of the shop stewards and officials of the union that's circulating at the base. And he moves closer and closer to those people. And then when the strikes break out, he's right there, you know, and people invite him to come along. He's really, and, and at the same time, the officials start seeing him as a problematic person. And when he presents his first seminar on his findings at SWAP, the NUM people present lay into him and lay into SWAP and say that he's part of the third force, etc., etc. Now, now this, is, this raises a whole set of questions for participatory action research. Because you start going in there and you think that you're working with the shop students. I mean, the shop students say, they welcome you with open arms and you're going to be working with them and you ask them what the research agenda is and you're going to work together. Now you find that actually they're going to be, in three weeks' time, they're going to be chased off the mine and beaten up by strikers who form their own committees. So what happened? Where are you in this situation? Are you also going to get chased off because you're too close to the shop stewards? You know, or do you find yourself like Crispin actually together with the workers? So I think there's a whole set of questions that, 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 are, that some of the chapters in the book analyze that are really important and that I think comes back to perhaps the difference between conceptually between critical engagement, and Eddie's talked about the tension between the autonomy and the engagement, the participation and support, but also the autonomy, which is, a, which is an idea which has emerged out of experiences of these of research sites as power laden fields, and the struggle of different groupings, different factions, to capture the researcher. I mean, I'm just going to give you one image of that. In the shops at Ifield Steel, I'm doing my PhD research, the shop students say, they, I'm waiting outside the plant. I'm not allowed inside the plant. The manager won't get me into the plant. There's, there's some guys who come running to me. I don't know who they are. They're sent by the shop stewards. They just say, they can't speak English. I can't speak Pedi. I can only speak a bit of Zulu. They only speak in Pedi. They just say, come, we're going into the plant. They take me into the plant. I arrive, and as I arrive in the mass meeting there, the main shop steward that I spent a lot of time with, his fist goes into the air. He's got me there which means that he's brought me into the plant that manager wouldn't let me come into the plant. I, I was delighted to be captured like that. <laughs> but I'm saying that fundamentally there's a question of capture. And there's a lot of discussion that takes place in our circles about how powerful the researcher is yeah. and how less powerful the people that we talk to are and that we extract it. Undoubtedly that is true. Undoubtedly that's part of what's happening in research. But there's something else as well. That Sakela's article points to in the book, which is that unions, workers, shop stewards, general secretaries, whatever, are appropriating our work, turning it into their own language, their own analysis. I mean, you've heard professors talking about social movement unionism. Who ever has heard of anyone in Kasati talking about social movement unionism? No one. Because it's not a term that has any traction in the union. There's other words that are used. So I'm saying even the words for who Eddie is are going to be different from how Eddie thinks of himself. So I'm saying that there's, an, there's, a, there's a kind of a, a, an engagement that's taking place and a kind of a contract that's taking place which has been negotiated and power is distributed in very unanticipated ways across the field that we work in. And that's one of the exciting things about it. But I think that we, do, we overemphasize to our own cost, our own detriment, but also um, with the results of misunderstanding the field and our own work in it, when we see people as totally disempowered and that we have to, you know, find ways to, well, 
empower them. People are empowered also in relation to us in ways that we don't necessarily understand. When in 20 years' time they say there was this guy, Sona Bile, who came, man, and this guy didn't know what it was about. We told him this, but actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, truth, Carl, you out of all But also, the agenda <coughs> element as well, Carl, you know, yeah. I mean, in, in other contexts, especially in rural contexts, where people who have access to researchers are largely male who are articulate, you know and who can speak English, who can speak, you know, quite versatile, who, who have been engaged with other lawyers and who have been acting as gatekeepers, you know. And you find that, that I mean, I've encountered uh, a lot of situations where you find that women farmers who have been dispossessed as well, I mean, in the context where we're, we're quite quiet, we're quiet in, the, in the meetings. So I had to repeat the meetings quite a lot and focus on, on the women. Because in, in front of these men who articulate, they believe that we brought this researcher now, and we used to do, are going to bring lawyers to fight for it. So, I mean, there are, there are, there are multiple layers of, 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 of power asymmetries that I think we should be very much aware of. Do you want to follow? Thank you. Thank you. I should mention, Carl, that after you had this discussion, you know, I felt steel. The Vice Chancellor phoned me and said he had a call from Michael Steele, the CEO. And he said, what the hell are you doing, Eddie, with your researchers? What are you doing out in these, uh, this rupture? This is the CEO of Michael Steele. But uh, look, I, I, I think... And you said, he's been captured. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he said, I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that that actually gets to the, the heart of um, uh, uh, Jane's question, and I just want to, uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but I, what you, I agree with what you, what you said, so uh, I'm not really saying anything fundamentally different. The, the key thing about the idea of um, critical engagement or public social is that you're having a non-academic audience. That's my simple answer to you. You, you, you're moving away from your peers. And the, the, the point I would emphasize, and, 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 and the way I put it in 1991, uh, was pressure exists on scholars to make uh, a clear declaration that their research should be constructed as support for and on behalf of a particular organization. That, that's the, the dilemma. That's the and, and, and it, 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 I think we shouldn't uh, try to um, evade the contradiction that lies at the heart of what we're talking about. Because the academic project is judged by your peers. It's, it's unequivocal. Blind review of your peers. But when you go to a, a non-academic audience, uh, there's a different set of criteria. So you'd court and I argue that quite clear. And I, I, I think uh, I don't think any of us evade that because you all end up publishing journal arguments. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that these days it's the central objective, and I think it makes uh, the extra economic audience much more difficult. To us. It's getting no real recognition, but it is a contradiction. Mm -hmm. it, I think if you if you deny that, then you're not really being honest about your own situation in the university because that's how you get tenure mm -hmm. and that's how you get promotion. Now, that's a reality, it's a contradiction. But I don't think, I think the task of, of the director and, and, and all the research is to manage that contradiction. I don't know if I have a good answer, but it, um, as a poet, Kelly, I, I I have a deep sense of that writing for no audience. <laughs> um, and, um, but on, on, on a more serious note, but I think in a way maybe Glenn, Glenn's question also, also provides, I mean, one could also teach it. And, and I think that is a, it's a really, um, I think it's a really important point that Glenn makes here about that our first audience, Eddie, you always say that, our first audience is our students. As, as university lecturers. 
Um, our first, yeah, our first public is, 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 is our students. Um, and I think, I mean, in labor studies in South Africa, those of us still doing labor studies, that's a question we need to ask, is the, um, the state of labor studies and the teaching of labor studies and, and where does it happen? And, and the interface between labor teaching our, our full-time students and trade unions. Um, I think that still happens. It happens at WITS, and I, I know the, um, the Neil Agate Center at, at, at Rhodes University. But it's still... still uh, uh, yes, it yeah. is. Yeah, and, and, and the Global Labor University at, at, at WITS University and, and, and other parts of the world. So, I, yeah, um, whether we look at that in a, any systematic way in the, in the book, Glenn, I don't think we... I don't think we we uh, we 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 look at that as a as a as a um, as an issue in and of itself. Um, um, Jane, you asked the question earlier also about um, social media and, and, and video. But I should mention in the series in Bristol University Press, uh, there's a, there's an entire volume that will deal. Uh, I think it's just been published or it will be published soon on on new, new social media and, and public sociology. So I think there is an interest in that and, and, and it should be a really interesting interesting volume. So I just wanted to, to pump that. In addition to our own book, it's a really, really interesting series uh, uh, by, by Bristol uh, University Press. I, I'm sorry, Glenn and, and um, Kelly, it's most probably not a very helpful answer, but it's because I don't have a good one. Mm -hmm. But, but, so, I mean, it's just an observation on Kelly's question. I mean, I don't think, you know, we don't have an answer to that, to that though. I mean, it's, it's part of the dilemma. I mean, it, the, this sort of dilemma is reflected in some ways in, in Brittany's chapter, you know, where she's talking about uh, the urge, the necessity for a food movement, the struggle, a food sovereignty struggle, and, and the absence of one. And as someone who's committed to working with the movement, now who does she work with? It doesn't, you know, there's a kind of contradiction in its heart. It's something that Jackie also confronts in her chapter to some extent. So, you know, the, the, there are these problems where we recognize something that we regard as an urgent and pressing social problem, and no one else does. So what do we do? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think that's, there's a whole set of questions that we should, I mean, ways in which we, we should need to be able to address that kind of question. Um, you know, or do we only go and do work where there are movements? I mean, that's another kind of way of answering it, if we commit it to movements. So, there's a kind of set of dilemmas that are attached to that. Uh, thanks, Paul. Oh, you want to say something, Christina? As a food justice researcher, I wasn't going to because of keeping people away from supper. Um, and that seems wrong. But um, I think, you know, Kelly, that does resonate with me. and. Um, I think partly relates back to Jane's question of multiple audiences, and yes, you named several who weren't interested, but um, kind of keep reaching for more and more audiences in the hope that one of them is interested in the work and takes it up. But also I think it leads to your next research question then, of why is no one interested in this work, and how can we get people to be interested if it is indeed an issue, and if it's not, why is it not? Or maybe it needs to be a legal struggle, or maybe it needs to be a some other form of struggle, and so for me, I think often the next research project grows out of the out of the previous ones, sort of less resonant sections, um, and so that's maybe one way of addressing it as well. Thanks, President. We're really running out of time, but Asanda wants to say something. I'm only going to give her, and then I'll close. Asanda, are you there? Hi, Sonali. I really, really wanted to say something. Ted said if I have other questions, uh, but I think if we're running out of time, we don't have to. But the question is going to be around the future of critically engaged scholarship in light of some of the challenges that I think people have highlighted in the room, but also challenges that authors highlight in their chapters. But I think we can leave it. And uh, thank you so much, and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks so much to you, Asanda, for the very interesting questions that have led to a very good discussion. And thanks for bearing with us. 
you are in unexpected difficulties, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke very well of that elsewhere. <laughs> and it is very precise. So I'm not going to go into those politics. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for coming, everyone. And um, I hope you are stimulated. Let, let me have a copy of the book, Car. I find this book not just interesting in detail, but also very beautiful. It's so professionally done. Excellent book. Please. Please buy it. Hold on to your copy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a 50% discount going on now. If you don't have that voucher, please email the send us will send you, and then you can get a 50% discount up until the 30th of October. Thank you very much, and thanks to the authors and contributors who have done excellent work. Thanks to the team that has kept us sailing in the midst of the storm, the <laughs> technological storm that we have faced. So, thanks for it. Let's give a round of applause to the audience. One more big round of applause. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it that you've joined us for the first launch. This is just, just, this is just the first launch, please. Please know, this is the first launch. The next, uh, the next launch is going to be early next year in Stellenbosch. And we have other launches as well. So other authors will have time to talk. And if you have questions that you have today, you can ask. And maybe when you get the book, you want to ask more questions, you can attend those launches. Thank you very much.